to jump into the landscape seascape approach now, right? So this is back to number, there you go. So I just wanna start off by saying that I am very new to NOAA. Uh, I just joined a couple months ago, so I've only been in the mitigation world for less than three months. Uh, but coming from being trained as a scientist, I just told Susan Marie to throw me into the fire and uh, I'll figure it out. So if you have any questions, please direct uh, to her as I am still learning. <laughs> so if it feels like I'm kind of reading, it's because I am. <laughs> Okay, so why should we consider the landscape seascape approach? Well, in the 90s, the Corps and EPA uh, changed their preference to a more watershed approach for compensatory mitigation. However, the watershed approach doesn't always work in an estuarine or marine habitats. Plus, with a lot of modern urbanization uh, and high populated densities, it can be really difficult to acquire sites for restoration that are in close proximity for the impacted site. So even if restoration sites are available, they can often be very expensive, which can drive a lot of compensatory mitigation sites more inland away from the impacted region. So this is just kind of an image depicting uh, what I just said, where uh, most impacted sites are located in more higher density regions which are often coastal, while most of the banks were located in less densely populated regions, which is often not coastal. So now the fun part, let's go through some key definitions. The, poly de the policy describes landscape more uh, by interacting elements that are important to conservation objectives for the resources under consideration and not by size area. So you can find more detailed, uh, so I don't have to read these slides to you word for word, uh, definitions in our policy, which are, uh, the links are on the handouts that we gave you. So what do we mean by human systems? So this considers that landscape and seascape, seascapes include the world around them. So, you know, this is often roads and bridges. So what does our policy say about landscape seascape? And that is to apply a holistic landscape or seascape approach. So the policy outlines uh, selecting the best options that achieve conservation objectives that would allow for the consi uh, consideration of a wide variety of, mit of mitigation options, prefacing in-kind compensation uh, for difficult to replace resources. So when doing such a holistic approach, it can allow for the development of multi-use mitigation strategies. So here, I just kind of want you to know that a conservation objective is the measurable expression of a desired outcome that can be either species or habitat focused. So NOAA recommends developing landscape or seascape management that incorporates the best scientific information available and complements existing <laughs> conservation plans. But keep in mind that the management plan should be open to collaboration with partners and stakeholders. So. So why use the landscape seascape approach? Um, as kind of briefly mentioned in earlier slides, so this approach helps identify locations for compensatory <coughs> mitigation if nearby locations are unavailable or financially impractical. And taking this approach can also help in selecting the best mitigation options. Not all plans will be appropriate for making mitigation recommend, uh, recommendations or decisions. So we need to determine how well the plan addresses resource and habitat needs. Keep in mind that you still uh, must meet the mandated requirements, so replacing of services and functions for say the Clean Water Act, compensatory mitigation, or recovering of species according to the ESA. So this is just kind of an image that uh, mentions the Tampa Bay Estuary Plan, which is a good example of landscape seascape approach. So it takes into account the the needs of not only the area around the bay, but the bay itself. It identifies preferred location for restoration and protection, and these preferences can be used to guide mitigation decisions. So what if there's no landscape or seascape plan? In this case, NOAA will be evaluating mitigation options by considering both the proximity of the compensation and the impact, and the impact to the site and equivalency and ecological type. So with respect to proximity, uh, there are ecological considerations uh, that need to be taken into account for estuarine and marine species. In some cases, the marine boundary, such as the extent 
of the lateral drift cell is going to be more appropriate than watershed when considering comp the compensatory mitigation options. Another proximity consideration is that many impacts to coastal areas occur in, in uh, urban settings in addition to providing ecological services, aquatic resources, and urban areas also provide sociological services. So fully offsetting the loss of habitats in urban areas may require doing restoration and other um, actions in urban areas, which will uh, have its own unique set of challenges. So the NOAA mitigation procedure recognizes that aquatic systems provide multiple benefits and states that as long as conserva conservation um, objectives are met, compensation should be implemented so that the benefits stay within the community affected by the proposed action. So proximity is particularly important uh, when an impact occurs in the natural marine sanctuary. In that case, compensation must also be located within that sanctuary. The, uh, so here is an example. The expansion of the Port of Anchorage provides uh, a good example of taking landscape and seascape uh, approach into, um, to proximity. So the Army Corps preferred uh, option was to compensate in the same watershed as the impacts. However, NIMS recommended compensation um, in a creek that is not in the same watershed, but an area more valuable habitat along with the same migratory corridor for the fish. The Army Corps ended up agreeing with NIMS and the port provided funds to preserve 60 acres of high value estuarine habitat at the mouth of Campbell Creek. Uh, with respect to equivalency in habitat, the NOAA procedures state that the, that the preference should be given to compensation that is the same type of habitat or species affected um, by the impact. So out of kind um, compensation is unfortunately the norm when it comes to many estuarine and marine habitats. So for example, when the city of Virginia Beach uh, wanted to conduct dredging, their consultants proposed a one-to-one -one compensation for impacts to marsh habitat, but only a 0.33 to one for mudflat habitat. So a marsh does not provide the same function and services as a mudflat, and there's no good reason for offsetting mudflat losses at a less than one-to-one -one ratio. The procedures do talk about situations when out-of-kind compensation is appropriate, Mo, uh, most importantly, when it would achieve the best conservation outcome for aspect, uh, affected species and habitat. And if anyone has any questions, Susan Marie will, I'm sure, very much enjoy answering them. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. Any questions on a landscape and seascape approach? I know I have lots of them. Um, this is, as I said, a kind of a new idea. Um, I'm glad to have examples like Tampa Bay, which I, I think is a great example of taking a landscape seascape approach, um, and I hope that uh, we'll have more of those. Any thoughts, additions? I think we've got one in the corner. I think the policy language is a little conflicting or misleading on this topic because it it talks about the seascape landscape approach, but then in the text itself, it says with a preference for on-site and in-kind for difficult to replace resources. And I think reviewers will focus on that uh, preference for in-kind and on-site over the, the concept of seascape or landscape. Okay, so that's specifically for difficult to replace resources? No. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, go to South Carolina and, and look at the 30 miles of marsh that goes inland. That is not a difficult to replace resource. So, so yeah, that in, in kind is for difficult to replace resources is specifically for things like corals. Um, seagrasses, depending upon where you are, there's a lot of seagrass restoration going on in Florida. Um, but if you talk to people in Virginia about seagrass restoration, they'll throw their hands up and say, we can't make it work. So um, it's, it's going to depend. But yeah, that, that, is, um, that would be an instance of, um, I forget what it's called, but, um, pardon me? Well, no, I was gonna say not, not reading the entire sentence. There's a word for that, but I can't come up with it right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a, a question about 
I guess it's a statement and then a question. Um, so one, the, the, the 2008 rule doesn't do a great job incorporating you know, seascapes and ocean compensatory mitigation. And so there should be update at some point. But the second part of that was- Are you identifying. volunteering for that? <laughs> Sure, I could throw, <laughs> well, we do need more you know, ocean information other than it's difficult to mitigate and real estate instruments are difficult. That's basically, that's not the sum of it, but, um, but when we're talking about seascapes and you know, categorizing watersheds in the ocean, is there information that NOAA is gonna make available to how they would categorize kind of our service areas in the ocean or? Um, I, think that, I think that is a great project for us to, to be working on, so yes. I mean, it's, it's being done piecemeal. So for example, in Puget Sound, yes. we, we already have those, those sets of, um, I think they're defined by bars in the, so, so in Puget Sound, we've done that work, um, but that's, um, it needs, we need a lot more of that. Yeah, and you know, funding is obviously, we don't, there's not endless monies to do all these cool projects. You know what? We have science centers in NOAA. We should get them working on that. <laughs> but that would be, you know, especially because watersheds, you know, obviously that's that's the backbone, that's the foundation. But the watershed runs out, you know, at the high tide line. And yep. so, what do we do with the ocean impacts, the shoal impacts, yeah. um, continental shelf, all that? And yep. so, um, whatever help NOAA can, you know, do with the court help facilitate it, understand these, and be able to defend these better would be. You know, something to consider. Yeah. So my brain is going to more some of the tools that exist for some of this. So I know NOS was working on Shoalmate, and it's a mapping program that maps the different shoals that are out there. And then there was oh, also, wow. and I'm I'm blanking on it, but there was an effort um, to do almost like landscape management, like planning, but for the oceans. Oh yeah, well, that was really controversial like six years yeah. ago. Yeah, and so I'm blanking on it, but they still exist and they yeah. still function in some of the, the different um, areas around the coast where they're trying to do things like, this would be a good area for wind energy and this is right. a good area for, um, and, and so they're trying to actually do like planning for yeah. ocean management. That was under the National Ocean Policy. Yeah, so there's there's stuff that's been <laughs> happening. It's mostly, uh, I think one of the disconnects that might be happening on some of that is that most of it's happening out of the National Ocean Service, whereas most of your compensation and your recommendations and all of that that's happening on the permitting side is happen happening, most of it's happening within NIMPS. And so you're looking at two branches within um, NOAA that may not be engaging yeah. um, as I, I had forgotten about that marine um, seascape planning effort so thanks for reminding me we'll have to go get that info from them all right thank you so I think we have lots of time left to hop into mitigation methods I think is next Methods of compensation, yes. Okay, so this is going to cover um, stuff that's in the procedure in um, one of the later sections. And um, let's get started. So first we've got our traditional methods of compensation. And first I should say that we have two sections in the procedure. One is methods of compensation. So like restoration, preservation, enhancement, creation. The other section is mechanisms of compensation, and that deals with permittee responsible, bank, in lieu fee, that kind of thing. So we have our, our standard um, methods of compensation. Um, these are terms from the Army EPA 2008 mitigation rule. Um, Restoration is defined as returning a site to its, well, as actions that have the goal of returning a site to natural um, or historic functions to a former wetland or a degraded wetland. But we had to take the words wetland out of all these definitions because we're dealing with things other than wetland. So it's a, a little awkward. One of the interesting things about 
the definition of restoration is that there are two subdivisions of it, rehabilitation and reestablishment. These were created because there was a time when we were really interested in how much of the restoration is actually resulting in new acres of wetlands on the ground and how much of the restoration is not resulting in new acres, just new function. Because if you think about it, if, if we're losing acres of wetland and compensating it by restoring acres that were there to begin with but just were not functioning very well, we are looking at a net loss of acreage. Hopefully not a net loss of function or service, but you are looking at a net loss of acreage. So we created these two types of definitions. I'm finding most people don't use them, and, and that's okay. You know, if it's not useful to people in the field, then it shouldn't get used. Um, but I just wanted you guys to know that they're, that they're, they're out there. Um, so here's an uh, example of rehabilitation. Um, a wetland that was there already as a wetland but was very degraded. And so um, they went in and restored tidal influence and upgraded the functions and services. Reestablishment um, from the lovely town of Provincetown in Massachusetts, um, where they were redoing the uh, municipal airport. And because the airport originally had been built on wetlands. Um, they had the opportunity when they were redesigning the runways to convert pavement back into wetlands. And so that's an example of reestablishment. Enhancement is um, an interesting term because this gets used a lot of different ways. It was originally conceived as actions that are taken in a fully functioning wetland that somehow changes that wetland. So in this example, you've got a wetland that naturally doesn't have any nesting areas for wood ducks. So you put in some wood duck nesting areas. And so you still have the same wetland, but you've got an increase in some of the functions. Um, in some cases, enhancement can also lead to a decrease in function. So um, for example, if you had a shallow oxbow area, and you wanted to deepen it so that bigger fish could use it, so you put in a weir and you deepen that um, aquatic area, you've increased the function for the, the bigger fish, you've decreased the function as a hiding place for smaller fish. So enhancement can work both ways. I have been finding that um, a lot of the rehabilitation, so restoring an area that's still a wetland but is degraded is being called enhancement. So it's, it's kind of at this point up in the air how people characterize things, um, which can be confusing. So um, for example, uh, you put in biohavens and uh, enhance habitat for fish, ducks, other waterfowl. So one way to kind of keep track of this is this little chart that, that we put together of, you know, what is the site before, what is the site after, and what would you call it? And what kind of functions and acreage gain change happen? Again, what's most important is that we're doing this work, <laughs> and uh, it's probably less important what it gets labeled but if there's ever a point at which we really need to keep track of this, this is the structure we should be using. All right, and then we've just talked a lot about preservation, so I probably don't need to revisit that one. But I will. Here's a, a preservation bank in California for riparian habitat. And then we have um, what most people call creation, but that was considered too biblical. So um, it was named establishment. And, um, and that's essentially creating an aquatic resource out of an upland. And um, usually not very successful because you can't just scrape down a soil and put water on it and call it a hydric soil. But it still happens sometimes. 
One of the questions we get with respect to restoration is whether restoration projects are self-mitigating. So if someone gets a permit to do a restoration project, and this happens um, a lot with, for example, dam removals, um, because a dam removal is a restoration project, but it also has profound impacts on the ecosystem, and you lose wetlands, usually, when you do a dam project. And so a lot of times, people who are doing those projects will say, well, what are you meaning I have to compensate for this? It's restoration. But sometimes you do have to compensate, and basically um, what we tell people to do is we, we just need to look at the balance sheet and, um, and what will be lost and what will be gained. We also get asked if research or education can be used, and actually that should be as compensatory mitigation. Um, so sometimes with um, marine species, we know so little about where these species are um, migrating or where they're spawning or where they're raising their young that it's hard for us to make informed mitigation decisions. And so there are cases, particularly for listed species, where financing studies would advance restoration and recovery um, better than taking a shot in the dark and just restoring some place when we don't know whether it's gonna help the species or not. And then education can be helpful if you're dealing with actions by the public that degrade natural resources. And if education will um, eliminate those effects by the, the public, then that's actually a good way of compensating for impacts. So in the procedure, we talk about research and education being important, but not generally considered appropriate methods, um, except in certain situations. However, research and education can be measures included in compensatory mitigation plans to, um, to enhance the effectiveness of those compensation measures. Here's an example from um, one of our consultations where we had um, a project that was going to affect green sturgeon in the American River watershed. And um, we really needed a better understanding of their behavior in the system. So the project proponent funded some research on that. And mitigation ratios that um, initially were three to one were reduced down to two to one. So it was kind of a way of combining restoration and research. Um, as I said, education can be helpful. Um, one of the good um, examples of this is the use of lead shot and lead sinkers in the environment. Those were causing adverse impacts. Public education got people to stop using lead shot and lead sinkers. Um, but the thing with, with education is that you need continuous engagement. You know, this is not a one shot and done. Um, and if you really want to know if you're going to be effective, you need to measure it. So it's kind of like monitoring, but it's a different kind of monitoring and there aren't really clear standards on a lot of this stuff. We also get asked about invasive species, the removal of invasive species as compensation. And there are a number of questions associated with that. You know, when is that appropriate? Um, what limits should be placed on it? And how do we calculate the compensation provided by eliminating invasive species? The procedure talks about this being appropriate compensatory mitigation when those species are impairing ecological function, and really, when are they not, um, and when you can get a measurable long-term reduction of the invasive species. And we need to have assessment methodologies in place that can quantify that. And it's really important to have long-term management plans to make sure that if a species is eradicated, that it stays eradicated. That's why they're invasive species. They tend to come back. Um, I do spend a lot of time on Cape Cod, so um, <laughs> that's why my examples tend to be from there. Um, but this, again, is um, an example from the Provincetown Municipal Airport where um, an earthen dike was constructed that reduced the tidal influence to some of the marshes. And so one of way of removing that species was to build some box culverts to bring the tide back in 
and maintaining that amount of inundation on the, um, I think that was, that looks like Phragmites, yes, um, knocked it back without needing to use um, insecticides, uh, herbicides, which was nice. And then we get asked about doing mitigation on public lands. So many of the habitats important to our trust resources are on subtitle submerged publicly owned lands, often by the state, sometimes privately. And they can be challenging because, for one thing, it's difficult to protect submerged lands. Um, you know, you can put up signs saying, hey, you're in seagrass areas, be careful, don't you know, drag your propellers through it. But it's kind of hard to enforce that. And then state lands use can be limited by policies and um, regulations or just, um, just individual understandings about the proper use of a state land. We talked to someone in California a few years ago who thought that oil and gas drilling in public lands was a perfectly good use for state lands, but doing restoration of seagrass beds on them was not a good use of state lands because there was no public benefit from it. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting um, subject to talk to people about. So the procedure talks about, yes, we are gonna be doing compensation on state lands. Um, and there are a number of considerations for that. One of them is to make sure um, that if we are going to be doing compensation on state-owned lands, that it's not um, a project that the state is going to be doing itself. Um, that's this concept of additionality that you hear about a lot in the mitigation context, that if the state land is, if the state has a program, for example, for, of protecting seagrass beds, then protecting the seagrass beds as part of a mitigation bank is, is probably not appropriate because the state's already planning on doing that. For example, <laughs> Massachusetts has an in lieu fee program that uses public lands. And it's a great example of, I did not know you were going to be here. <laughs> no, this is a great example of using public lands. Yeah. No, this is a great example of using public lands for compensation for impacts. Um, enough said. <laughs> If you want to know more about it, talk to Ashley. Um, another example of um, a way of enabling the use of public lands is the state of Oregon's administrative code that lays it out very um, purposefully that they will grant permanent easements for conservation purposes for Oregon state lands. and. Um, uh, the restoration site at Linton Mill, just north of Portland, was uh, implemented using that regulation. They were, they were already planning on doing um, restoration on the mill site, but as a result of Oregon's code, they were able to expand the restoration site into the river, and they have a permanent easement for that part of the river for the restoration. And then, we got some very interesting questions about combining in lieu fee funds and our grant programs. So, um, you know, can we do that? And if we do that, how do we keep track of the credits? So the procedure, uh, it turns out, and of course, we had to ask lawyers about this. <laughs> And the lawyers looked at all the information we had and kind of broke it down into two um, situations. One, the Clean Water Act pretty um, clearly, but in a backwards way, says no. You can't use in lieu fee funds f to be um, matching funds for our grant program. So let me take a step back. Most of our grant programs require some kind of non-federal match. And so you'll get a certain amount of money from the federal government, and you need to provide some kind of match to that, in kind or, or cash. 
And if it's a Clean Water Act compensation project, you cannot combine those funds. However, if it's not a Clean Water Act compensation project, then there's nothing in our regulations uh, that prohibits that kind of an arrangement. And then you're left with the only, so you can use in lieu fee funds, say for um, an Endangered Species Act um, compensation, but you have to keep track of how many credits are generated by the in lieu fee funds and only the credits associated with those in lieu fee funds can be sold as compensation. So you can't be using public funds to create um, compensatory credits that can be sold. That's the basic arrangement. And that's the end of methods of compensation. Any questions? So my question, I was wondering why um, the 404, well, maybe you explained it because it sort of says it in the, in the, in the Clean Water Act, um, why um, mitigation funds uh, couldn't provide, be able Can to you provide match. Back up to the slide that has the exact language. Yeah, so. Um, so, oh, maybe I don't. I, Go back one more. Do I have the language from? No, I don't. Okay. So, I don't remember the exact language. Anyone from the core? So, you, you can't double dip on your credits, right? So, that's what you're talking about. Um, that's a separate issue than this. Um, so, no, you can't, you can't take fees for, that are compensating and then compensate for another project and have it double dipping. Um, this is talking about, so this came out of um, the, the uh, Restoration Center um, and the NERDA program where they're getting money from Superfund sites and they were, the Restoration Center also issues grants and they got requests of can we use these NERDA monies to also be your non-federal match and then can we, um, can, we, can we do this? And there was some concern about, well, we can't be um, supplementing, or like the, the federal government can't subsidize what you are responsible for as a party for your compensation. And so there's a backwards way of writing in the 2008 rule that says you can do it, you can, but then you don't get credit for it. And so if you don't get credit, what's the point in doing it anyway? Because you need to get the credit in order to meet the 2008 rule. So that's how they wrote it in this weird way of like, if you do this, then you can't get the credit. And so what Susan Marie was saying, so under the 404 program, the way it's written, you can't, you can't do it essentially. Other authorities don't necessarily limit that. So there are programs out in, and this is where it came up, was mostly on the West Coast region with things like Bonneville Power and other, I think it's Bonneville Power, but there's other situations where it's the hydropower program, it's user fees that are put in place um, that are supposed to compensate for impacts and hydro dams, and then that is being used as non-federal match on grant programs because it's a user fee but that user fee is put in place because of a hydropower condition. Um, so it, it gets really complicated in there, and so essentially what, the, what Noah was trying to do is say, it's gonna be a case-by-case -case basis. We have to be able to be clear on the accounting that we're not subsidizing this. And the procedure then goes on to say, the best way to do this is to have basically here's your restoration project, and then next to it is going to be your compensatory mitigation site. So it makes a bigger area overall, but you kind of keep the money separate. Um, so it, there are a few cases where this came up as just kind of being really tricky. And so it was kind of one of those, on a case-by-case -case basis, if we work with our lawyers and we're very careful about not having the federal government subsidize what you are required for, 
um, then we could look at doing some of this. But as Susan Marie said, the, the crediting has to be split out. So that way you're not um, the federal government. And that was the other part that came up as troubling with this is how can you say, like, if you have a project and you add non-federal match for it that is um, part of a required compensation, if the project fails in a restoration site with a grant, typically you might be able to say, this didn't work, it, we walk away, and we're really sorry about that, we'll try better next time. You don't get to just walk away from a compensatory mitigation site. You have to actually bring that site up to meet those credits. And so making sure that those arrangements too are happening on the site is something that's, that's very important as well. So the language that's in the um, 2008 rule, it's actually best explained in the, in the response to questions. It says, um, if a federal program has a 50% landowner match requirement, neither the federally funded portion of the project nor the landowner's 50% match can be used for compensatory mitigation credits. So it's kind of a backwards way of saying you can't lose, you can't use in lieu fee money as non-federal match. Yeah, okay, I understand where that's coming. And I, and I totally agree, we don't want, we want to avoid a situation where there is federal or state um, subsidization of mitigation. Right. And we work hard to do the accounting and transparency to make sure that happens, you know, with or without being part of something where there's another grant. But I, I do, I, I would propose that it, it there are ways um, that it could, that the in lieu fee, um, in lieu fee money could be used um, in conjunction with a federal grant um, there, in, in, with, uh, without having that, you know, complication because there is ways that we can, you know, we don't, you know, we can uh, maybe parse out, you know, or say parse out a piece of the site right. um, and say this is the mitigation piece and or say a percentage, the 10% or 20% of the funding. Um, but I think the, the, the the, the, I think there may be barriers to, there's, there's been examples, several examples, I think, where there is a barrier to in lieu fee contributions to a project because a lot of the restoration projects are getting grants and there is either a perceived or real inability for in lieu fee funds to contribute. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I just, th I think that there are ways that it could yes. be, that it could as be a done. As a supplement. I mean, the language I just read goes yeah. on to say, mm -hmm. however, you know, anything provided above that 50% match can generate credits. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a combining of the two. Yeah, I just didn't understand why the 404 has been separate, whereas where other programs could do the match and the in Luffy couldn't. That's what, that's what I didn't yeah, quite understand and the rationale there. Yep, it's, again, it's, it's um, neither our language nor the cores is, is written as clearly as it could be. And, and this stuff is really best explained with examples. So I'm curious about how the third bullet here um, is explained with regards to your project proponents. Um, the, entity, the entity administering the compensatory mitigation fees, so that would, I assume, be the third party yeah, to the in, whom the, in the program. project proponent yeah. grants those fees. Um, retains their responsibility. So that implies that there would need to be an in lieu fee program document or something that transfers that mitigation liability to that third party. No, no, let me back up. So again, best explained by an example. So if you have um, a restoration project where half of it is being um, done by our community-based restoration program and the other half is being funded by the in lieu fee program. Um, that site's going to need rest, going to need monitoring. Um, I'm sorry, I'm on a different subject. Um, the point is that um, we, if NOAA is funding half of that restoration, but we cannot be held responsible because we're funding part of the restoration for ensuring that it's successful. That's the job of the in lieu fee program. 
So there was a concern when we talked about combining NOAA grant funds with in lieu fee project funds, well, not combining the funds, but with a project. There was a concern with doing these combined projects that somehow NOAA would be on the hook for ensuring the success of the in lieu fee part of it. And, and so we just wanted to make it clear, which apparently we did not, that um, that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so I'm coming at it from the other side where the project proponent normally would be responsible for the other half, right? They're the one cause, paying the fees, causing the mitigation out of their project. Oh, yeah, so, so the way an in-lieu fee program works is that that person who pays into the in-lieu fee program is transfers, the, the requirement for success transfers from that person to the in-lieu fee program. Right, with a program document. Um, I, actually, I don't know the exact mechanism. It depends. Yeah, it's typically through a program document. And so my concern here is just that as you agree to in lieu fees, in lieu fee payments, that it's really clear that that mitigation liability is transferred mm -hmm. and that it doesn't come back to yeah. NOAA through their right. grant program or through the to the project proponent. Yeah. So I work for Federal Highways, so if we pay into an in-lieu fee program mm -hmm. um, or the DOTs pay into an in-lieu fee program, that transfer happens. What happens after that in terms of it being used as a, you know, potentially as a non-federal match or something like that is subject to the program agreement. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't necessarily have any idea right. if those monies then went forward. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have a few more questions, and I think based on the remaining topics, now might be a good time to ask them. Um, you know, sure. So you're one of the people who's leaving early. <laughs> uh, no, I just looked oh, like okay. we're flying through this pretty quickly, and uh -huh. um, you know, you mentioned in the beginning that this policy is really kind of what Noah's already doing, and most of it summarizing it, providing yeah. a consistent policy. I guess across the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, reading reading this, there's a lot of. Well, let me back up. Uh, it, it seems like a lot of it's also based on mitigation rule. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot of mention about mitigation banks mm -hmm. and ILFs, but mm -hmm. no mit no mention of advanced mitigation? We're working on that. You know, as soon as the procedures were finalized they were already out of date. <laughs> um, advanced mitigation is something that um, we're very interested in, um, particularly on the West Coast. And um, we have, um, we're actually have a draft document on advanced mitigation that is based on, um, there's already some Army Corps of Engineers guidance out on advanced mitigation. And I think the state of Washington also has its own document on advanced mitigation. So for those of you who maybe don't know what we're talking about, advanced mitigation is um, where a project proponent, often like a port or something like that, um, knows they're going to have compensation needs in the future, but they're going to be, in this example, like a few spread out over time. And rather than every time they have to compensate, they go out and this is permittee responsible, essentially, um, and doing it one by one, they just want to do it all at once. So they're kind of like doing their own personal mitigation bank. It's like a single user mitigation bank where, it, or again, permittee responsible mitigation done up front and then you draw off those credits as you have compensation needs. So yeah, we're working on that. Yeah, and the way I explain it is it's basically a mitigation bank just without the ability to sell credits. Right. So just the permittee can use them. And Washington does have an interagency guidance, mm -hmm. uh, Department of Ecology, Army Corps, yep. and the Fish and Wildlife Department. Yep. Um, we'll be borrowing heavily from that. Yeah. But nothing in the policy itself um, seems to limit the use of advanced mitigation. Correct. And there's a lot of 
talk about flexibility and cooperation. Yep. Um, and the policy mentions how banks and ILFs have kind of the mitigation hierarchy where the banks are preferred um, and they produce the best or highest quality. Um, and at least from what I've seen, I would say advanced mitigation is above ILF because ILF usually collects funds and then goes and builds a site mm -hmm. where advanced mitigation is like a bank um, where it builds a site before the impact. So there's not the temporal loss that you would see on an ILF. Yeah, so how many mudflat banks do you think there are? <laughs> banks? Uh, Zero mudflat banks. We've got two advanced mitigation sites. There you go. Yeah, so the pro, I mean, banks are great when you have them. Um, as we heard in New England, they don't have any banks in New England. And it's very hard to find banks for mudflats and tidal creeks and oysters. As a matter of fact, um, I think on Wednesday, I'm chairing an, a session on um, compensation in estuarine and marine habitats. And, and EPA did a great study looking at what kind of compensation typically occurs for those kinds of impacts. And then we had some interns do some work, and I do a recap of the policy. Um, so anyway, banks are great when you have them and when they have the right kind of credits. But for coastal resources, that's rarely the case. A dual, con uh, a dual bank with wetland and like fish conservation, um, some struggles we've, we've run up against is wetland people just thinking about the wetlands I know. and not the fish. <laughs> yep. um, so, you know, the, the a wetland can't look just like a wetland, for example, open water. Mm -hmm. uh, fish need open water, yep. obviously, for especially when you're in a floodplain and doing stream restoration along yep. with floodplain wetlands. Are, are uh, you going to be in the regulators <laughs> forum tomorrow? I can be. That would be great because <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to bring up the topic, why aren't we compensating for open water ha habitat impacts? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and um, our bank actually got um, you know, less mitigation uh, generation ratios right. for open water yep. and for fish. So then, you know, we're trying to argue um, where we're trying to benefit fish, yeah. create fish habitat, and support, you know, the Native American uh, fish um, use and, and existence, I guess, yep. at the expense of uh, wetland credits. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah, and I guess we're told there is no advanced mitigation policy by NOAA? Not, not yet, and there, and there won't ever be a policy on that. As you said, our policy allows for it. What we need to do is amend the procedure to include a section on advanced mitigation, and that's what we're gonna do. Okay, yeah, it would've been nice if the policy uh, I know. acknowledged advanced <laughs> mitigation. So the next update, uh, that could be added. Yes, yeah, every five years, <laughs> or okay. as needed. All right, and then that was one of my questions. Um, because we, I guess when you have an impact project, you know, uh, and there's like ESA impacts, NOAA reviews the impacts through the Clean Water Act uh, permit. So in, a, in essence, that's how we've reviewed and approved advanced mitigation sites in the past with NOAA mm -hmm. is through the Clean Water Act um, and permit. an ESA consultation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And had it documented through that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then, interestingly, also in the policy, uh, unless it's in the procedures, there's no discussion of baseline conditions. No, there is and not. And enduring <laughs> effects. And the because it depends on the, on the authority. So baseline conditions are a big deal under, um, cir under CERCLA and OPA and, and our, our NERDA program, our, the, the trustee programs. Um, and I think for the other, actually, ESA people, is baseline conditions a big deal? Probably depends where you are in the country. Yes, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, it depends. So that's why it's not addressed in the policy. So remember, the policy was, is a high-level decision framework. And so um, things like what's the correct baseline to consider is very dependent on the authority as, as well as the individual situation. Yeah, like on the West Coast, uh, you probably know this, but how NOAA interpreted baseline conditions has changed recently. Um, and, you know, we were told that was consistent across the country, which doesn't appear to be. Um, but for ESA consultations, um, for example, ports now, um, in the past, we didn't, you know, we, we permitted and mitigated for structures that we put in originally. Mm -hmm. And then now when we maintain structures, um, we're reviewing and providing mitigation for maintenance. Right. And now the baseline condition is before the structure was right. there instead of the structure actually being there. Right. Um, so where if we don't do anything, the structure is just going to, you know, fall into the water and be there. <laughs> if we don't maintain it. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's a great example. Remember, I started this by saying we had a whole bunch of issues, and some of them we addressed in the policy, and some are more appropriately addressed some other way. That's an issue that was addressed some other way. There's an MOA now between NIMPS and Army Corps on that, right? Uh, only for core, pro core projects. Okay. So like uh, core property or waterway dredging. Mm -hmm. They don't have to follow that. Okay. Everybody else does. Okay. Um, so there's a loophole so is their, what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, that's their agreement. Um, but and then seeing the Provincetown Airport example, um, it'd be interesting what program that was under, if that was Clean Water Act. That would have been Clean Water Act. Baseline um, evaluation on that was. I'm sure it's all online somewhere. <laughs> okay. All right, I think that's it for now. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or um, big thoughts? I should probably move on to the next module then. So it turns out that the core, or no, actually CEQ, I think, coined the term the mitigation sequence, and then the core coined the term the mitigation hierarchy. And I have people in my agency who get the two confused. So the mitigation sequence is the idea of avoiding, minimizing, and compensating. And I just loved this example <laughs> of, of what the mitigation um, sequence might mean. So there are a number of challenges in implementing this. Um, sometimes applicants will want to jump right to compensation without the first two. Again, that's, that might be just a, a, la a language problem because most people, when they hear the term mitigate or use the term mitigate, actually mean compensate. Um, also, as I've mentioned a couple of times, with ESA to recover species, sometimes um, compensation is a better option than avoiding and minimizing. And because we consult on the same project under different authorities, this can all get um, kind of confusing. So in the policy, <laughs> we say apply the sequence appropriately, which is about as um, open as you can get. But then it definitely talks about first considering avoidance, then minimization, then compensation as our general order of preference, but that sometimes there will be situations where you will deviate from this because um, doing that would achieve environmental benefits consistent with the specific authority you're working under. So for anyone who's not familiar, um, this is what the mitigation sequence looks like. Um, avoiding by not taking a certain action or part of an action or modifying the action to avert all impacts. Minimizing is limiting the degree or the magnitude of the impact action or its implementation. And then compensating, replacing or providing equivalent substitute resources. Um, we got a lot of questions from CEQ about this concept of additionality, which we didn't really think was necessary because it's kind of inherent 
in the definition of compensation, but because they were really concerned about additionality, we added language saying that providing an additional benefit is a requisite of calling something compensation. So, avoiding, I'm sorry, can you go back? Oh, I have a back? I do, okay. So, um, avoiding is taking that building that's in the back that would have been in a wetland and just moving it out of the wetland. So you have avoided the impact. Minimizing, one of the things that um, we use in NOAA is uh, bubble curtains to minimize noise impacts from pile drivings. And compensating is um, restoring, preserving, enhancing, or establishing environments to compensate for lost functions and services. So, as I've said numerous times now, um, there's a lot of flexibility in the application of this mitigation sequence. So here's a kind of a, a typical application of the sequence. We've got somebody who wants a 404 permit to dredge and fill three acres of eelgrass for a marina and a waterfront restaurant. First, avoid put the restaurant on an upland. There's nothing about a restaurant that requires it to be on the waterfront. Um, minimization would be redesigning the marina so that you need to dredge only one acre of seagrass instead of two, and then compensating by restoring two acres of eelgrass in the same tidal system to compensate for the one acre of eelgrass that was authorized. Here's a little bit of a different example where we're working under the Endangered Species Act and the applicant is dredging urban harbor bottom. And as part of the same project, proposing to restore 10 acres of high quality habitat in the same system. And so in that case, the biologist might make the decision that, you know what, we are not going to worry about trying to get that two acres down to one acre we are going to accept this as a good idea and a good conservation outcome for the species. And then my favorite example of the mitigation sequence under NERDA, um, avoidance is out the window, it's already happened. <laughs> and um, minimization is really just cleaning it up. Um, and so then you go to compensation. So it does say that NOAA will generally recommend or require avoiding adverse impacts to high value habitats, and it goes on to talk about what those high value habitats might be, those irreplaceable or difficult to replace. And, and what's interesting is that difficult to replace seems to vary by region. As I said, we hear that eelgrass restoration in Florida is going really well, and our Virginia field folks say we cannot get eelgrass restoration to work in the Chesapeake. Probably has to do with water quality. Um, or it might be the species of seagrass. Um, so, but again, avoid irreplaceable, difficult to replace habitats, um, habitats that are crucial to achieving conservation objectives. Um, that might mean habitat areas of particular concern under our essential fish habitat provisions. Um, or just habitats that provide important ecosystem functions or contribute to ecosystem resilience. And that's resilience in terms of climate change and sea level rise is a pretty important consideration. And the procedure, and, or actually this might be in the, I can't remember if this is the policy or the procedure, but it talks about looking at the scarcity of the habitat, its suitability for trust resources, and its importance in achieving conservation incomes, but you don't have to have all three of those to characterize something as a high value habitat. That was all in the policy. And in the procedures, there is additional information on the terms that are used in the policy, scarcity, suitability, and importance. These types of habitats are often identified in conservation or management plans. Um, ha. <laughs> Quiz time. So, uh, tropical coral reef, high value habitat? 
I'm seeing some nodding heads. No, you can't play. <laughs> you put this together. <laughs> All right, cattail marsh, high value habitat for NOAA species? Nah, <laughs> not really. Um, California eelgrass, a high value habitat? Yes. And Alaska tidal marsh, a high value habitat. It is a trick question, but it is yes. Alaska tidal marshes are not particularly scarce, <laughs> but they are extremely important for the salmon up there. So it is a high value habitat. Um, how about the Linton Mill restoration site? Is that a high value habitat? It is because a lot of public and private funds were put into creating that site. <laughs> that is very difficult to replace. Uh, mangroves in Hawaii, high value habitat? Trick question, mangroves in Hawaii are invasive. <laughs> I know. Same would be said for Spartina altonaflora on the west coast, Those are, that's invasive. All right. Um, so the procedures also include other considerations about um, high value habitats um, that you would consider preservation for those habitats and that climate change protections might affect what is considered a high value habitat. Any thoughts on the sequence and high value habitats? Okay, I think the most important um, takeaway from this is that that mitigation sequence is um, flexible when it comes particularly to the Endangered Species Act. <laughs>